Welcome to episode 13 of 4Shot Podcast, where we discuss all things HCS and some things Halo. I am your Miss USA Phelan, and with me, I have my runner-up Fade. How are we doing, Does Fade? Does that mean I'm from Mexico or something? The Mexican one? Well, you're Miss, US, you're Miss USA runner-up. You're from whatever Oh, Miss state. USA. Miss it's Universe. Exactly. I, I was I'm, thinking Miss Universe. I'm obviously Did you... New York. <laughs> Okay, okay. Did you see the Donald Trump like comments or whatever? Oh yeah. Yeah, that that's what I was referencing. That was funny. Oh, he's digging himself a bigger, bigger hole every time he. He can dig as big as he wants. He'll just buy his way out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we did miss last week's episode mainly because there was a lot of Halo to watch and catch up on and notes to take. Um, and my ties to drink. Yeah, and 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 Fade being on vacation. <laughs> So, first and foremost, how was your vacation? It was very good. Or, I guess, like honeymoon, I, technically, not vacation. Yeah, well, I mean, both. Um, but, uh, yeah, I went to Hawaii and uh, had a great time. Lots of drinks, sitting by the pool and went to the beach and everything. Slam with sea turtles. That was pretty cool, actually. The wild ones. Did, did you just, but, like, hang out at a resort? Or did you, like, go see the island? What island uh, were you both, on? Both. We were on the big island. Okay. Uh, we went. We stayed at a resort. On the, uh, so the Big Island's actually pretty separated. It's like the volcanic island, so like yeah. half of it's all like just volcanic rock, and then the other half is all jungle. And we were on the volcanic rock at, island side, um, but we did take one day. We drove the whole thing, which took all day, but uh, it was uh, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, it's it's a place I hope to get one day. I have a friend that lives out in Oahu, so um, I'd like to cool. go see her at some point. That being said, let's kick things off here. Um, no current roster stuff to talk about because transfer periods are over. That doesn't matter. Scrims. I don't really think there are any that scrims before the tournament. We're going to keep this before, I guess. Um, yeah. Not worry. I know I've been seeing teams scrim a bunch recently, but as far as before yeah, the tournament, there denial wasn't, and stuff. wasn't that much that I was uh, aware of. That was it seems like a lot of the teams practicing kind of kept it under wraps almost. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. So then let's just roll into the meat of today's podcast. Indy. PGL Indy. The big old tournament. Uh, we're going to skip past winner's record rounds one and two because it doesn't really matter. I think the only notable thing to talk about there was Wart 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 Returns. <laughs> uh, it was nice to see an old school Halo 2 classic team name showing up like that. It made me smile. Yeah. Even though I think they didn't win a single game the entire tournament. <laughs> That's okay. They're winners in my book. <laughs> so, starting things off then uh, Liquid versus Reality Check. Everyone was hyped for this match. It was, you know, everyone got pumped after Liquid just recently getting Reality Checked. You know, this was the first potential upset. Yeah, I think this and and what we'll talk about next, the Noble Excellence, are really the only two matches in that winner's round three with the top 16 teams that, in a big tournament, on land, had a chance of happening. I don't really think Optic or, or like, CLG, obviously, or uh, Cloud9 or anybody anybody else was going to lose in the winner's bracket so early. Um, So... I think these are really the only two matches, and yeah, after last week, the Liquid Reality Check probably the biggest one. Just uh, who's gonna get sud on this this time? But uh, yeah, yeah. So let's kick things off. The first game here was uh, Shrine Bomb, and Reality Check came out hot. They went up one nothing after about five minutes in or so. They got a super nice spawn trap, um, just one round of spawn traps, and you know they were able to capitalize on it. And uh, get the early one nothing lead, um, but uh, Liquid just kind of kept battling and battling, and time was running against them. They were still down one, down one. Not sure if they were going to get anything. Then right around the 16 mark, uh, Spartan comes up huge with the triple kill, and it ends up setting up Liquid to get that one uh, one tie. Um, and then the game goes to overtime, and it you know kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Um, seeing what's going on, and then Ninja comes up huge. He, he gets the sniper and uh, gets a bunch of like uh, no scope body shots. Um, his teammates pick up the quick headshot, you know, one shot kills, and Liquid's able to arm the bomb to take the 1 0 lead. Um, it looked a little shaky off the start, 
uh, you know, it is Liquid's probably first real matchup of the tournament, or potential matchup of the tournament, so um, they didn't come out firing at first, but, you know, yeah, I mean, in the win. You have to give a little bit of credit to Reality Check because, uh, you know, I, th I don't think they're as talented as, as Liquid, but they came in here and played them uh, and, and took the lead early, like you said. Um, and honestly, I feel like, you know, the next the next game also, but I feel like Reality Check lost this more than Liquid clutched it, to be honest. I feel like uh, they almost choked a little bit. They had the lead, and then they choked. Yeah. But uh, that's the kind of the way I saw it. Um, I feel like that's just I kind mean, of Reality Check's MO, is they really have, they you know, they come out firing early, and then they have trouble Almost like a out. mental block, yeah. Yeah. Like against fin it finishing top eight. It seems like Reality Check kind of has Liquid's, like, number. Um, when Reality Check plays some of the other top teams, you know, you don't see the scores being this close, but whenever they play Liquid, I don't know if it's, you know, Ninja and the rest of Liquid getting a little uptight that they already lost Reality Check once, or if it's just yeah. Reality Check flying high knowing that they can beat them because they've done it before, but, you know, these matches tend to be closer than I think they should be. Yeah, I think I think that's probably what it is, is the reality, they have a little bit of confidence from, from upsetting them before um, that... You know, it's like, hey, we can do, we did it once, we can do it twice, type of mentality, and uh, so that that's probably what it is. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I thought Reality Check played pretty well up until like the la about the last um, five minutes of the flag or the bomb game, even maybe less than that. They really had control of the map for the most part, and it didn't seem like Liquid really looked like they were going to be uh, be planting a bomb until towards About the end. The like the 17 said, mark. It was about yeah, two minutes left when you know they started getting Spartan a little, got the big Liquid got a little bit of momentum, but you know they still weren't really getting much past the 50 yard line. And then when Spartan got that triple kill, you know that was just enough because if I remember correctly, they barely got the bomb arm at that point, but it was you know it was yeah. just enough to get it. And then at that and point, I think, they were able to take control. I think what happened, like to me, it seemed like once that ha once he made that big play, you see a lot of the top players like if the other team makes a big play, they can recover from it. But it didn't seem like Reality Check could recover from it. It was almost like they they were like, oh god, what happened? And then they started like losing their cool a little bit and charging off individually and things like that that and it just seemed like they they kind of let you know a big play or a little bit of momentum swing turn into a huge momentum swing yeah moving into the second game then um warlord slayer reality check at one point is up by 12 kills um once again they're flying high winning you know you pretty much got the map on lockdown but then, you know, Liquid kind of settles themselves and they, you know, inch away, slowly but surely, they inch away at that lead. And they end up coming back and winning 50-45. So this is just another, you know, what we just talked about with Reality Check coming out winning early on and then for whatever reason just struggling to close out. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Walsh or Strong Side commentating this game. But they're just like, oh, game's over. They're up by, t Reality Check's up by 12. You can't come back from that type of a lead on this map, and, and generally that is true. On a Warlord Slayer, you're almost never going to be able yeah, to make a up a 12 team, kill. You shouldn't yeah. give up that lead. Yeah, they shouldn't. And, and even as an amateur team, like a top amateur team, you shouldn't give up that lead either. And it's kind of like what I said towards the end of that the first Shrine Bomb game that you know they kind of once the, the momentum started turning, it seemed like they got flustered and then just like let it slip away. And snowball and just get even worse for him and stuff. So, yeah. So, Liquid ends up winning 2 0. Remember, this is right before the. Or is it one before, two before the round of three? Uh, where they play three games? Yeah, this is the last round yeah. before they play three. So, it was only two games. Liquid ends up getting the win 2 0 in and, and games where maybe they should have lost both, which could have really shook up the tournament a little bit. But uh, Reality Check gets kicked to the loser's bracket. Um, and one thing to note, um, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about reality check again, and I don't think we will. So I'll bring it up now is straight sick has been, uh, picked up by the team or was picked up by the team for, um, a PGL, was it PGL? Some online yeah. tournament. I'm not sure. And, and, and probably the last online cup of the, it's not really an online cup. No, is it, they're still doing that, right? The, um, the, like, money-only tournament yeah, online tournament? Yeah, last time I heard they were. I haven't heard that yeah. they weren't. So. 
Um, I'm not. He was picked up for uh, septic. Is septic did have to leave back to um, England? I think. Right. Although Sims did say he was only going to be gone for well as little time as possible. I guess he's trying to line up the visa to come back because apparently he really liked it here. But yeah. So in the meantime, straight sick. Um, I would say just off the papers. That's you know a little bit of improvement on the roster. Nothing against Septic, but Straight Sick has has at least has a lot more experience. Um, yeah, I mean Septic is really talented though, so it'll be interesting to see how how much difference this makes. I still don't see this roster as being one that's going to be a top eight team. Yeah, I think if maybe um, so. they let go of Dome and picked up and brought Septic back in his place, and. Maybe the roster could compete. I'm not sure at that point. Yeah, I still think something has to happen with Sud One. No offense, you know, I can't see the twins splitting up, but no, I think uh, personally, I think Sud Two is the problem. Really? Yeah, hmm. he, he's the one that Sud Two is the one that has the attitude problem. I don't think that the Sud's like issue has been uh, skill I feel like or anything like that. From a skill standpoint, Sud One is inferior to Sud Two. Maybe I'm not sure. I haven't watched them. Yeah, I mean, I don't that watch much all recently. That much, but but uh, yeah, definitely their attitude uh, stems a lot from Sud too. Hmm. Yeah. Either way, it'll be interesting to see if the team, what you know, if Straight Six sticks with them, you know, heading into what will be Halo Five or where they go from here. Moving on then to our next game. Um. Excellence versus Noble. Um, another you know, eight versus nine. Uh, whenever these teams play each other, they you know tend to be super close. So um, Excellence, you know, has the eight seed. Noble's fighting for that last spot to go to the final. So you know this was definitely an exciting match to watch. We kick it off with Shrine Bomb, and uh, Contra is on fire to start this game. He gets a running riot early on. Um, I think. Before he ever got a death, you know, he just came out the gate with the running riot, had the sniper, just did work. He and um, and no one ends up going up one nothing, pretty much right off the bat. At that point, yeah, that that was a yeah. He had some some great play on that one. Yeah, he you know he he controlled his opponent's hut better than you see you know most people do. Like he did, he did a damn good job of just locking it down, forcing them to spawn rocks the entire time. It really seemed like that was what their game plan, what his job was, was like. Because it seemed he just beeline basically almost for their hut, and then he just sat there, and he was just like, "I'm gonna stay alive and be annoying and a nuisance here, and uh, just kill as many people as I can while I'm in this hut." Yeah, you, you know, Contra is known for his one-on-one uh, ability, so him, get, you know, being kind of put by himself on an island in the hut, you know, it lends to his talents because you know he knows he's got kind of has to deal with anyone coming at coming at him in a one-on-one situation, and that's where he shines. <laughs> Um, so then, uh, Noble basically keeps holding map control, and then right around the 19 mark, uh, they go up 2 nothing, and at that point, Excellence finally, you know, kicks it into gear, and they start pushing, and, uh, they come close a couple times to get a bomb plant, but they end up not getting anything, and Noble holds them off for the 2-0 win. Um, a little shocking. I expected Excellence to play a little bit better than they did, you know, it wasn't about the last maybe two or three minutes that they even potentially tried to look like they could win the game. And it was more or less all noble, the whole game. Yeah, I mean they they and they kind of set the tone for the series a little bit. Where I felt like they controlled the the series each game type. I felt like they really controlled it more so than excellence. And, and it really looked like noble was probably the higher seed, but uh, not the case. But we'll get into that a little bit later too. Yeah. So second game kicks off Warlord Slayer. Uh, noble takes an early eight kill lead. And it looks like they're just going to run away with it again. And uh, L-Town does a really good job of controlling camo um, pretty much the entire game. Every time he had a time down, every time he'd come up, he'd jump up there. He also had a shoddy um, running around with that Predator combo, as they've been calling it uh, recently. Yeah. And uh, he was doing work, and that, that brought excellence back into it. Um, and then the game kind of gets deadlocked for, you know, the latter, the latter half through the 30s into the 40s. And excellence, you know, just kind of squeaks it out at the end with a 50-48 win. Um, yeah, and and even though Excellence won, it, it didn't feel like they um, were ever in control of the game. No, I would say L-Town was the only player who looked like he was in control right. of the game for his team. And, you know, maybe he just did enough 
by himself to keep his team in it, and that's what it took. Because, you know, he did... His control of Shoddy and Camo was huge, and people, you're starting to realize just how important, you know, that Camo is on that map, especially yeah, with the Yeah, you really saw, you saw it a bunch throughout the entire tournament, actually. Yeah. Moving into Game 3, then. Series is tied 1-1 at this point. Going to, you know, Game 3, best of 3. Lockdown ball. Um, right around the halfway point, it's a huge lead uh, for for Noble. Right around the 8-minute mark, 100-6. to six. You know, they came out strong. They got a setup. And Excellence, you know, whatever they wanted to do, they could not break it. They could not get past the setup. And, you know, Noble looked like they were just going to run away with it. And then all of a sudden, Excellence starts bringing it a little closer. Um, they, they finally get a setup of their own holding the ball. And they bring it to yeah. 84 to 100. You know, there's five minutes left. It's anyone's game pretty much at this point. 16 seconds is nothing. And then Noble just locks it down, gets the last 100 seconds straight, more or less, ends up winning 284. Um, yeah, and the one thing to note here, and I believe the commentators touched on it also, is that Excellence, like, it almost seemed like they refused to even pick up the ball until they had a full, complete setup. Um, so there was no, like, you know, there's no grab scrapping. It to, scrapping a few seconds or rotating the ball or anything like that. No, it was like, we're holding it if we have all four up in setup, and then the second that breaks, we're tossing, we're play balling. Yeah. Um, which can work, but you have to really be able to lock down that setup, and, and that's difficult to do for a long period of time. And, and um, you know, they did get there. Well, they did do that, but like Noble, Noble had the setup and just held it easier. But they were scrapping time when they could. Also, that first hundred seconds that they got wasn't really from a setup ever. That was like a lot of scrapping time. Like maybe they got you know twenty seconds at a time or something like that. But no, like. 50 60 second holds so yeah in the first I, one this yeah. the, the last hundred was i think ap- actually almost all at once yeah so. i think it, there was only one point where they had to drop it or, or at that point and then they yeah. picked it right back up yeah well yeah i mean you look at it and i'm pretty sure those six seconds were almost right off the start for excellence and then uh noble got 100 and then excellence gets was it 78 and basically yeah. in a row, and then Noble gets another hundred in a row. So it was very much a, a game, a, a one, you know, a back and forth. It wasn't, um, you know, get a little here, get a little there. It was, you know, get a bunch of huge chunks and hold hold us up as best as we can. And both teams tried it. And unfortunately, in this situation, uh, Noble comes out on top, and Excellence gets kicked somewhat early on to the to the losers bracket. Yeah, and like, uh, that... this is huge because the teams are battling for that last spot. So. We'll get to a little later on who ends up getting it, but yeah, it was huge. Yeah, it was a huge... Noble stood pretty much no chance of getting claiming that eight seed uh, and taking it from Excellence and if they didn't win this uh, series. Yeah. So winning this series was absolutely huge for them and really opened the door uh, for them to get an, a top eight seed uh, going into the season two final. Yeah. So then we're going to head to the winner's bracket round four. We're finally in some uh, best of three games here. Um, best of five and best of five first to three <laughs> that's what i meant numbers all around of course of course princess <laughs> uh kick it off with number one seed eg versus number nine noble um i don't know if i just missed this series or if it was off stage um it, um, been no, it, it, it was been on first... stage it was real quick it was really quick though um, I, I think it might have none, been the, first none of the match games of the morning. and that's why what's I, that? I might have been sleeping it might have been the first match of saturday morning yeah, I think it was. So it, it, it definitely was. Um, uh, but EG gets it, the it was, sweep. It was. Uh, the, I, if I'm remembering correct, the first game, um, actually, um, the Shrine Flag game, mm-hmm. I think was the one that uh, ended up being... It, it was actually fairly close for a little bit. And I think uh, Noble actually scored. Um, I don't think they scored twice, but I'm pretty sure they scored once against EG. And then the the lockdown Slayer game was uh, fairly close as well. I want to th- I want to say it ended maybe uh, only like three or four kills. And then uh, the ball game though, um, I believe EG just dominated it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, not that much to really talk about. We expect EG to win. You know, they three zero sweep them, kick Noble the losers bracket. Noble still fight for that eight seed, so they're gonna have to do some work in the losers bracket to you know scrap that the points that they need. Moving on to the second game, um, 
C9 versus CLG. Um, there, were, you know, I, I normally I've been commenting on each game, but in this series I was kind of, you know, I was I was awake at this point, but I was so in trenched in the games because the games were all just freaking so close to each other that I, I completely yeah. forgot to take notes because I didn't want to take my eyes off the screen um, <laughs> both, all, all the games um, were super close C9 ends up winning 3-1 but you know all four of those games could have gone any way to any team at any point you know I would the only one that C9 looked like they were in control was the uh, the, the fourth game Warlord Bomb I think they ended up winning 5-2 to two or 5-1 to one. Which was kind of surprising because uh, C9 has been known to struggle on Warlord, especially Warlord Bomb. Um, but you know, other than that, you know, the other matches were a, a coin toss, and C9 ends up pulling it out, three one. Um, I think that these might be the two most evenly matched teams we have in the top eight right now, as far as skill goes. Every time they play each other, it's it's a coin toss. I, I mean, it's a coin toss. Yeah, I, I would I would say that's pretty pretty accurate. Um, I'd toss Winter Fox right in there uh, with them as well, though. Those three, I think, are all pretty. Uh, but but they don't play as often, obviously, yeah. because on the C9 online, they're on the other side of their bracket. Five, pretty much always yeah. play each other. Yeah. So, yeah, CLG gets kicked to the loser's bracket. Um, I mean, it's kind of, you know, right around where you would expect it based off the series. Yeah, I think, I think we pretty much all predicted that Cloud9 was going to beat CLG here. Um, I think looking back at our predictions, we had... We both had Cloud9 in the top three, I think. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I think I think we expected them to, to beat CLG there. Yeah. And, and they do. It's kicking CLG to the losers once again where, you know, CLG is going to have to do some work. And, you know, we'll see. We'll talk to that later. But, they you know, they come up strong. The next game here is Denial versus Liquid. Um, this series goes four games um we kick it off on shrine flag um denial score pretty quickly right around two minutes in they get a one one oh score um whole they pretty much after the bomb goes up they don't give up map control uh liquid still just kind of scrapping and fighting and denial gets another bomb right around the 27 mark um bomb when i say bomb this is flag yeah, 27 mark, meaning three minutes into the game. Yeah, three minutes into the game. Already. They get the second flag, and then um, they end up getting the third one, wrapping it up 3-0. Liquid just, they seem to always struggle at the very beginning of a series. Regardless of who they're against, I don't know if I've ever seen them, you know, win the first game of a series, like, in a, in a handily fashion. They always seem to either struggle and barely win or get blown out. So I feel like they just need time to warm up or something, get ramped up. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it that could be the case. Um, I, I feel like their team is probably they're pretty momentum driven. You know, Spartan makes a big play, Ninja makes a big play, Shooter makes a big play. Who, whoever's making a big play, I think that kind of like kicks them into a higher gear, and then they start playing better. And so I think it, it takes them time to get to that point. Uh, you know, someone has to make that big play, or you know, get energized or whatever. So. Uh, you might be right that it takes them a little bit, and, and they just didn't have the spark in that first game. Yeah, and, and it showed like they, you know, I, it was all denial, all game pretty much. Moving into the second game, lockdown Slayer. Um, APG gets a triple kill super early on, and it, it gives denial uh, a lead, and they, you know, kind of look like they're going to control it and, and keep winning. And then all of a sudden, Spartan out of nowhere goes on a killing frenzy. It ends up putting liquid in the lead. Um, yeah, it, it it really shows though. He got a killing frenzy, and liquid had a one kill lead at that point. So, uh, you know, he's gone plus ten by himself at that on that life. So, yeah, pretty pretty impressive that they're only up one. Yeah, um, and then liquid ends up uh, keeping that Spartan momentum. You know, kind of like we just talked about, they're a momentum team. They keep the hype up. And they ended up closing it out 50-43, and they look like, you know, they might actually make a series uh, out of this yet. Um, heading into game three, Warlord Ball. Um, this was a super close game. The team kind of kept trading back and forth. Liquid's the first to, a to hit 100. Um, they end up getting it 100-91. to um, Denial ends up getting the lead back right around the four-minute mark. 
Then Liquid takes the lead at the three minute mark. Denial takes the lead at the two thirty mark. Liquid takes the lead at the <laughs> two minute mark. They just keep keep going back and forth. Um, right around the two minute mark, it's one forty nine to one forty. So Liquid has a nine second lead. Um, at one forty five left, Denial ties it up one forty nine one forty nine. Um, Denial takes a one sixty five to one fifty nine lead with less than one minute left, and then Heinz comes up huge, gets camo, um, and sits back. The ball is sitting down in front of the lift. And Liquid realizes yeah. that they need to get control of the ball because they gotta have, you know, they gotta have a few. Se- what is it? Six seconds to try to. Yeah, they're down six seconds. They have win, yeah. to get it. So turns into of, this little lemming. Yeah, instead of <laughs> situation. You know, I, I think this was maybe thirty seconds or so left at this point. They probably, ha- they definitely had enough time to slay, try to get some sort of setup, and then get the ball. Um, but it, all that would have relied on, you know, that one, you know, they had one shot at getting the team down and grabbing the ball, but instead they, you know, just like you said, just like little lemmings, they kind of one by one ran towards the ball and Heinz with Hamo, with Hamo, with Camo sat back at, uh, <laughs> the ramp at the other base and just kind of naded and then would, you know, take their shields out and then shoot them. And he did that pretty much to the whole team, ends up being able to pick up the ball himself, runs around with the camo and ball and ends up getting the win 173 to 159. Absolutely, and uh, I think that just goes to show the uh, experience of all the players on denial that they stayed calm, and you know he's able to not realize, hey, I don't need to sprint for that ball right now. I can sit here, utilize my camo, pick up these kills, then get the ball and secure the win. Yeah, a lot of players in his position probably with the camo would have been like, oh, I have camo, let me rush towards the ball. I'll be able to get a couple seconds. You know, Hines being the great mind that he is, one of the you know those more intelligent players that play this game. You know, he, he realized he could just sit back and do more good than, you know, getting the ball for five seconds and dying. Yeah. Or, like, rushing in, you know, end of the game, like, everyone's trying to get that ball. You know, nades are going to be going off all over the place. You know, then your camo's no good against the nade, so. Yeah. So, um, Warlord. Yeah, game four. Yep, yeah, game four, Warlord bomb. Uh, denial is up 2-1 at this point. Warlord bomb, denial scores first within the... They get the second bomb at the 26-30 mark. It pretty much all denial early on. You know, it, it looked like it was maybe going to be a one-sided affair. But Liquid finally starts rallying, rallying back, getting some map control. And they get a score right around the 23-minute mark to make a 1-2. to two. Uh, Liquid then, you know, keeps that momentum and get a couple super close uh, bombs. That, you know, they're maybe a second, two seconds away from getting the plant, the arm in the plant. Super close a couple times. And denial, you know, just does whatever they can to fend them off. And uh, ends up get, using, uh, I would say Liquid got a little too um, over pushy with them uh, trying to score, realizing that they need, you know, this is if they lose the game, they're going to lose the series. And, and they kind of pushed a little too hard. And at one point, Denial finally is able to uh, take advantage of that. And right around the 18 minute mark, they go up 3 1. Um, and then Liquid gets the bomb stuck in the portal for about 20 seconds with one minute left. I don't think it was, you know, obviously liquid wouldn't have done that intentionally because they were trying to get the bomb to score, but it was quite funny that with one minute left, you know, you're down to what else could go wrong and you get the bomb stuck in the portal and no one's able to grab it. Yeah. And if you're not familiar, basically the bomb sits in the very back of the portal so that you can't grab it before you actually walk through it. So you have to like try and nade it out or something like that. Yeah, so Liquid eventually gets it for right around like 30 to 40 seconds, somewhere in there. They get the, they finally get the bottom. Um, you know, not a lot of time to try to score two, but, you know, they're pushing and they're rushing. And then Denial gets some of the best spawns I've ever seen in the game. Pretty much, you know, right on top of Liquid as they're trying to score in the base. Um, destroy them, get them three or four dead, throw the bomb out, and that's it. Denial ends up winning 3-1 and ends up taking the series 3-1. Yeah, and, uh, and this is, I think, a fairly accurate representation of these teams. Uh, you know, Denial's better, but Liquid played them pretty hard and pretty well in most of the games, um, you know, that first one uh, being an exception. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, 3-1's right about what I would expect. Um, between, whatever but, and play. Not even just the 3-1, but that each of the games within the series was close, uh, except for that first game, that Shrine yeah. Flight game wasn't, but... Yeah, you know, Denial definitely showed that they were the dominant team most of the time in the games. I would say, like, if you looked at the time, like, the amount of time a team was not necessarily in the lead, but in control, um, it definitely favored Denial. But Liquid, you know, it wasn't obviously one-sided. Liquid was able to have their own sparks of uh, 
glory and get points here and there. And, you know, they did what they did, had to do to try to stay in the match. And, you know, 3-1 is still a pretty good series, especially with some of the matches being as close as they were. Yeah, and I don't think that we're going to, we're not going to be talking about Liquid again, uh, really. Um, And so I I just wanted to say that I think despite, you know, regardless of that one uh, um, killing frenzy from Spartan, I think he had a really good tournament, even without that. Um, And it seemed like he really was almost the X factor for their team when they're playing well. It usually came from him, I feel like. Um, So it, it shows how talented he was and how, you know, excellence placed well with him when he was on their roster for the Atlanta and everything. So uh, I think Spartan is, uh, you know, we talked about some of his communication and attitude problems and things like that. Um, but uh, as far as his, his talent and everything, he's a, a very good player. Uh, and I think he's really making a name for himself right now. Yeah, I would say pretty much every player on the team, except maybe Shooter, I don't remember anything big coming out of him. But the other three, uh, Ninja, Spartan, and Ares, all you know, they all had shining moments throughout the the tournament that I saw. And the the, the unfortunate thing is they couldn't seem to do it at the same time. And it, it's definitely a, a team that if they can get you know all on the same page, all uh, doing super well at the same time, could take down any of the teams. But it always seems like it's one player doing it while the rest of the team is either struggling or just doing average. Yeah. All right. Um, moving on then to our last game of winners uh, round four, Winter Fox versus Optic. Um, kicking it off, game one, Shrine Flag. Um, Optic does a great job right off the start, gets all the power weapons pretty much, and end up getting the first flag right around the 27-minute mark. Um, it seemed like, I'm not sure if it's Optic just coming out high, or if Winter Fox kind of came out flat, but, you know, right off the start, Optic looked, you know, they looked on top of the world, and looked like they were poised to, um, just end up probably getting a 3-0 pretty quick. It didn't look like Winter Fox really had an answer for them. But, you know, Winter Fox does the best they can to kind of stall it out, um, draw even for a few minutes, and then Winter Fox ends up rallying back around the 19-minute mark to, uh, get, tie it up 1-1. And then at that point, um, Optic ends up going, uh, the game goes to overtime, 1-1, it's tied, you know, next flag wins, Optic ends up going three down, and Maniac manages to get a touch on a flag, um, Raid is, I would say, within two seconds of it responding, basically if he didn't get the touch, that was it, um, that flag was going to be returned, and it would have been back to a stalled out, you know, Optic probably in a little bit better position at that point. Um, but he gets a huge touch on the flag and uh, ends up running it basically by himself while his team's responding back to his base and they end up getting a 2-1 win over Winter Fox. And, yeah, that was a um, really impressive. He basically dropped down from like their car, carbine, yeah, grabbed yeah, the it in the rocks, sitting... and then he ran it all the way through his courtyard, through their shotgun, and then under turret and capped it with the, with by himself. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> like, sure what Optic was doing. I don't know if they didn't know where he was. or yeah, Winter Fox, you mean? Yeah, I, that's about. I don't know if Winifox didn't know where he was or what was going on there, but it, it just it, I know he he stopped juggling it for a little bit, was. but but yeah, it just seemed like Winifox was like, oh, he got it and just gave up or something. Yeah, like um, like I said, Optic was three down, so he was the last one. So he de- he definitely didn't have teammates helping him out until they spawned back up in rocks. But he he, he didn't even get shot the whole flag run. Like yeah. he just walked it back in. So yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. We didn't really get to see any other POV of what was going on. We were pretty much only on. Maniac, but you know, props to him for making a clutch, a clutch uh, flag touch, and then end up getting, you know, the flag score on top of that and getting them the W. Yeah, it's really brave of him to do that because um, it it could have very easily had the. My guess is that Winter Fox was weak after they killed the other three of Optic, and so they kind of backed off a little bit, thinking that Maniac was going to challenge them. Uh, and so they backed off a little bit, letting him run it back. But had they just chased him and killed him or something you know that's four down and they would have had then control of optics sniper hut and everything and put themselves in a good position to get that that final cap um themselves so uh, interesting decision but uh for both teams really that you know maniac is willing to potentially go four down 
and uh, Winter Fox doesn't challenge him when he's doing that. But I mean, th- that's exactly how it played out. And props to Maniac for uh, making the correct decision in this case. Yeah, I you know no, not to take anything away from Maniac, but it, it it is more of I think Winter Fox made the mistake than Maniac coming up huge. Not just like I said, not right. take anything away. It was a big play, but I feel like um, it was more of Winter Fox clearly not doing something. It, it, at least it, the fact that he didn't get shot says something went wrong. Yeah. All right, moving into the second game, Lockdown Slayer. Um, Optic carries their momentum into this game and take an early 10-kill lead. Um, Lockdown's definitely one of those maps where once you get a lead, you can kind of sit back and hold it. If, if you know yeah, especially if you have pe- weapons. Yeah, if you know what you're doing you can, with the weapons, you can definitely hold it. Um, but Winter Fox kind of just uh, chips away at it uh, little by little and end up uh, taking the lead, 44-43. to 43. Right as, you know, the game's starting to uh, wind down. Um Winter Fox, um, when they have the lead, which is, I think, you know, it, it's their MO to be kind of, you know, quick and pushy and they don't sit back. And with the lead, they end up pushing to uh, Optic while Optic is, you know, more or less set up at BR Tower. And no one really, I, we don't know who made the call, you know, why they would have done it. They, t- they, would, they, I guess, yeah, were the inferior position at Snipe Tower. I get that. But you have the lead, you know, in a game that's... 44 43 it's super close you're generally not going to make that rush but they do and they end up going four down because of it they end up getting a bottom blue spawn uh, as a team and optics are able to uh control the rest of the map and get the 50 to 46 win um it, it was definitely a poor decision on winter fox's part to make that push the way they did yeah my guess is actually and it's surprising to me but my guess is it's from ryan noob I noticed there's a couple times throughout this series and when we see Winter Fox later on that uh, he just was very, very aggressive in times where it seemed unnecessary. And uh, I don't know if it was just like mentally he just wasn't in the game or whatever because he normally he's like, you know, student of the game type and makes great decisions and is very like knowledgeable when it comes to like teamwork and map positioning and all that type of stuff. But uh, so my guess is that he's the one that kind of like led that push um and it's just funny to me that that's something that he would want to do because it, it seems very the aggressiveness is very characteristic of him but the uh, the poor decision is not in my opinion though so. yeah I, but, but it definitely seeing, is a poor decision we're used to see it early i would say you know when the kills are in the 20s or even the 30s we're yeah. used to seeing winter fox even being down making that push constantly but in a situation like that they kind of have to uh realize that yeah this is the way we play but this is not how, you know, this is not the correct decision we need to be doing at this point. Yeah. Especially <laughs> having the lead. So, you know, Optic's up 2-0 and looks like they can take this series pretty quick. But the next two game types are Warlord, which Winter Fox, you know, this is their best map because of the quickness and the craziness. They're able to uh, play it the best. Uh, first up, we have Warlord Ball. Uh, Winter Fox takes the early lead. Um, Warlord Bomb. Warlord Ball. Bomb's the fourth game. Oh, my, my mistake. I am incorrect. <laughs> Warlord Ball. Yeah, there's two Warlords back-to-back. I thought that was kind of yeah. weird. Uh, so it's Warlord Ball. Winter Fox takes the early lead. Optic brings it back. Takes the lead of their own. Um, the game's all tied up 94-94 to 94, right around the five-minute mark. Um, with four minutes left, Winter Fox is able to get a little bit of lead, 111 to uh, 100. Um, the three minute mark, they just kind of kept on, they kept, they had a good hold going they ended up going out 150 to a hundred. Yeah. So um, they got, they got 39 seconds in that minute, which for warlord is uh, a huge amount of time. Yeah. And even better, they got, uh, 56 seconds to optic six seconds over a two minute period. Yeah. Roughly. So yeah, they definitely, you know, got a, a setup going and held it fairly well. Um, Around the two-minute mark, Optic finally, you know, they get the ball and they start bringing it back. It's 125 to 161, and it looks like, you know, if they're able to hold it, they can try to, you know, contest for the, the win. But uh, Winter Fox ends up getting them down, gets the ball, gets their setup back to where it needs to be, and, you know, ends up actually closing out before time runs out, 200 to 125, um, showing that, you know, that, that, that Warlord is, in fact, their map and, you know, where they shine the best at. Yep. Now, moving to Warlord Bomb. Yes, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> Winter Fox um, scores super early. They come out flying again, uh, 29-10. So 50 seconds into the game, uh, they, they get the first bomb plant and end up going 1-0. Um, 
to keep up the momentum. They get their second at the 27 minute mark. Um, Optic finally, you know, after I think they either went three or four down after that plant, um, after the explosion, Optic's able to get, get the bomb, get some control. Right around the 26 30 mark, they make it 1 2. Um, at that point, the game kind of just slowed down. It, you know, it was three bombs within the first uh, three minutes, 30 seconds. And then the game just kind of dies out for a while. You know, they're trading back and forth, trying to make plants. Nothing's really happening for either team. Um, Optic ends up doing just enough to kind of tie it 2-2. Two to two. Um, So the game's tied up. You know, we're kind of seeing where this is going to go from here. You know, uh, Winifox needs this to stay in the series. And then Nada just puts his teams on his shoulders. He must be doing squats. Uh, <laughs> getting nice and strong for the tournament. He grabs the bomb from spawn and then takes it right to the opponent base and plants it without ever dropping it. He just picked it up. He didn't juggle it. He didn't do anything. He just picked it up, walked to the base, planted it at the 1830 mark, and Winter Fox takes a 3-2 lead. You know, I, I just joke around about Nate and, you know, putting the team on his shoulders because obviously if he didn't even get, I don't even think he got shot. You know, being able to just walk to your opponent's base with the bomb and not get shot, you know, your team must be, you know, doing, doing something to help you out there to let you be able to yeah, do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Optic ha ends up getting Winter Fox spawn trap for the last uh, minute of regulation, and they waited until the right time to plant rather than you know get nervous and try to push too early and fail. Which you see a lot of teams, um, kind of similar to what we talked about Liquid earlier. Uh, a lot of teams will just kind of push it, and you know they realize that you know we got we there's a minute left, we, we got to score, we got to score, we got to score. But Optic was you know kept their composure. They you know. They didn't even worry about the bomb. They were worrying about map control. They finally get, you know, map control, I think, with, like, 20 seconds left. You know, it, it's starting to really get down there. But they, it ends up working out in their favor. They, they get the bomb at the 15-10 mark to tie it up 3-3. So with 10 seconds left, uh, the game's all tied. We head to overtime. Um, not too long into overtime, Winter Fox ends up grabbing the bomb, gets the quick plant and the win. 4-3. Um, uh, and, and the one thing I want to point out up to this point, all four games that they had played so far, far Nate had, had been going super negative. He just seemed like he was struggling in this in this series particular. And I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't really see his stats the rest of the tournament, but I know in this series uh, particularly, I was watching his stats after each game, and he was just, he, you know, they were uncharacteristic of him. He was just, you know, struggling all around. You know, he was going super negative, sometimes twice as many deaths as kills, and it was just rough for him. Yeah, um, I noticed that, and I, he does do quite a bit of objective. He had a lot of the ball time, you know, planting the bombs, like you mentioned, the one time going in uh, untouched and everything. Um, but he, yeah, as far as the the kills go, he really didn't have a very good uh, series. So I don't know. Um, it's uncharacteristic because normally, you know, historically you think of Nated and you think of like you know crazy plays with the especially with the sniper and things like that and he's just like going out of his mind as a like because he's traditionally been like one of the top slayers and not objective players yeah he's known but, for uh, his free for all yeah and so he's definitely changed the way he plays quite a bit and now i think the the he just needs to you know almost put it all together and put his slaying ability uh with his objective decision making yeah so after Optic goes up 2-0, Winter Fox wins both Warlord games, brings it back to 2-2. Series is heading to the final game of the best of five, Shrine Slayer. Um, this was another super close game. No team at any point had more than a four kill lead, which is kind of unheard of, um, especially with uh, in kind of the modern era where you tend to see more of swings rather than such just a neck and neck game. Um, Optic are up 47-46, and Randa disconnects from the game i'm not sure what happened uh i don't know if yeah. i got an explanation of what happened yeah they never really talked about it they just kind of said oh there was network connection issue and so now we gotta restart yeah and i the, the important thing here is as it was happening optic had you know complete ring control they were in complete control of the map they had all the wap uh, the one sniper that was up and the rockets so you know they they were poised to win that anyways and it, it seems a little shady that he disconnects at that point, and I'm not going to say that he did it on purpose, because I doubt he did. I don't know how you could get away with that on purpose on a main stage, but um, it was definitely unfortunate for Optic being in the position that they were. Yeah, the one thing that was very interesting about it, uh, or about the score and how Optic ended up with those weapons and everything, 
Ryan Noob had the sniper, and he was ring two. Their team was kind of set up on blue side uh, of the map, and then he decides... Again, this is like you know the the aggressiveness of Ryan Noob and stuff, but like in this situation, he has the sniper. It didn't make sense to me. He pushes out onto red pea shooter and charges with the sniper towards the people, the optic players in red hut, and dies very quickly. And then and gives them the sniper and and then map position and everything at that because Randa I think was in ring also and he was disconnected and everything. But it was just a very interesting decision on his part. Um, which didn't end up affecting much because they restarted, but I, I guess they gave one kill, and so they could have restarted at forty six forty six or something like that. Uh, but it was just an interesting decision uh, that I noticed. Yeah. So off the start, um, at, at the very start of the first, um, at the beginning of this game, um, who's the sniper for Winter Fox? Um, I believe it's Randa, isn't it? Was it Randa? I, I can't remember. I thought he might not have had it. But whoever it was ended up getting a nice... Or maybe it's Arcanum. I think it was Arcanum. He ended up winning the sniper battle um, in the in this first game um, on Ace. This time around, on the restart, you know, uh, Optic needs three, Winter Fox needs four, so it'll be a super quick game. Ace ends up getting this, winning the snipe battle um, on... Arcanum. So at that point, they only need to assault. Ends up getting the rockets. So at this point, Winter Fox is in a pretty poor to sit, or poor spot. Like you know, uh, Optic has ring control. They have the power weapons. There's really not much they can do at this point except hope that uh, Arcanum picks the sniper back up and can do something with it. But um, Ace ends up you know doing super well. He gets a, a snipe and then a body shot. Um, to let his team kind of finish up the kills, and they ended up winning 50 to 48. Um, and Optic ends up winning the series then 3 to 2. Kind of in the first real, I'd say the first real upset of the day. You know? Yeah, the, I mean, the Noble Excellence was an upset technically, but uh, I think we thought they were pretty evenly matched. Maybe we might have thought Excellence was a little bit better than Noble. Um, although, if we were doing a power ranking, I would say the Noble is better than Excellence right now. Yeah, I um, But, uh, so maybe that was an upset, maybe it wasn't. But this definitely, I feel like, was um, uh, an upset. Yeah, it is. it's our first major upset of the tournament. So, Winter Fox gets kicked to the loser's bracket, and Optic moves on. So, we're gonna um, head to winner's bracket five. Round five, I should say. Uh, at this point, it's, you know, four teams left. Uh, EG, Denial, C9, and Optic are who are left. Um, do you want to take lead here? Yeah, sure. Give my voice a little um, bit of a rest. Talking too difficult for you. Uh, my voice is starting to get a little scratchy, a little too quick for my liking. Miss New York. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the game one was the Warlord flag. And uh, right off the beginning, uh, Cloud9 got uh, EG um, all four dead. Um, with Pistol getting the camo shot. It's not not right off the beginning, but it's the first major thing that happened. It was very much a stalemate. Uh, just a lot of killing and not much happening before then. And uh, it allowed Cloud9 to score the first flag with uh, uh, at 9 minutes and 25 seconds. Um, that's supposed to say 29. 29. Yeah, so it actually wasn't at the very beginning, the first uh, minute or so. Um, and then... Uh, Shortly after that, uh, Cloud9 made a mistake and got too aggressive, and EG does what they do best. They capitalize and, and uh, scored and bringing it, uh, the, the score 1-1 one, one, uh, three minutes into the game. Yeah, I just want to um, say that the start there with C9, um, they, you know, they, they got all four dead right off the start, and Pistola was in control, and they were completely in control of the map. And I, I don't know if it necessarily shocked EG, because obviously EG is able to uh, tie it up right around three minutes in. But yeah, they probably I would say the best it was unexpected game. for C9 to come out on a map that they're considered their worst map. Um, and, and Pistola even said in an interview before this, this matchup that if they had a chance of beating EG, they needed to win this game. This was the pivotal game. If they could win this game... They had a chance of beating EG because they knew this is one of EG's better maps and this is one of their worst maps. So you know this was kind of uh, C9 was more or less you know put all their chips into this match and you know the first minute into the game they looked like they were ready to take the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so after EG uh, equalizes, Cloud9 uh, they get the flag. 
Um, 25 minutes left, and a uh, cap it. So this is five minutes in the game. They get their second cap. And Pistola, you know, his, along with uh, the, Cloud9 and their coach, uh, is controlling the camo. Um, they've had uh, most of them up to that point. Or whether it got burned or they actually controlled it. Um, and then um, Cloud9, uh, again, they slip. They go three down. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily Cloud9 slipping, but they went three down and EG just immediately pounces. Um, that's what they do. They just like, if they get a couple people down, they're just like, execution is flawless. They tie it again, 2 2, uh, with 23 minutes left or, or eight left uh, in standard regulation. Uh, and then 22 minutes left, um, Lunchbox gets a flag taught. He grabs it, goes to the portal, and uh, taught, and tosses it just as he dies up onto his team's flag. And um, one of his spawners, I think it was uh, Lethal, is able to grab it and put it in. And then uh, Roy gets a camo with 20 minutes left, so five minutes left in the game, and uh, is... I think we keep mentioning EG doesn't need very much uh, for them to... Uh, capitalize so the advantage from roy getting that camo taking it from pistola basically um let them get the the kills necessary and their team to get in position to uh score another flag so they score and they go up 4-2 in the game with uh five minutes left then uh with 15 or with 10 seconds left 15 minutes 10 seconds uh so 10 in regulation um cloud nine gets like a desperation late flag to make it 3-4 um and uh, they actually, Pistola is in position to pull a second one. And so they pull it real fast. You know, maybe they can have a miracle come back and, and tie this up to send it to overtime. But uh, not to be the case. And EG recovers it. Um, uh, ends the game shortly after that. So EG won 4-3, uh, even though they were probably potentially outplayed uh, I by think Cloud9. They were completely yeah, they, they're. Like- if we go back to what Cloud9 I said earlier, had control of the map. Could, yeah, if we Cloud9 go back had to how more often control the map. team had control compared to the other team, C9 yeah. won that battle. They won the slaying battle. They won the control battle. It's just, it, it simply came down to EG being able to take advantage they of capitalized. any simple mistake. They capitalized better than any team yeah, that is, uh, in the HCS. And we'll see throughout the rest of this tournament that almost on a regular basis, they were outslayed except in Slayer games. You know, every yeah. objective-based game, they were outslayed, and then, but at the same point, they still pretty much won all of those. Like, they're, they're they they have shown that they have a you know, EG definitely has a weak spot that they're losing so many uh, uh, of the you know the slaying type uh, point of the games. Even though they're winning the objective games, they are losing yeah, the slayer it, but portion. I think that's I think that's even just like. Uh, they kind of admitted that they didn't practice as much as they should have for this tournament, even so. I wouldn't say that they're weak in slaying or anything like that. Um, well, I'm not saying maybe that they're weak, just but I'm saying tournament. that they're showing that this tournament showed to me that EG is beatable, and you know it's te- teams have to be able to stop or figure out how to prevent EG from being able to capitalize in situations. Because teams have figured out how to control for the most part. They you know they figured out how to control games against them. They figured out how to outslay them. They just need to figure out how to not let EG make those you know. Uh, pick, take advantage of those simple slip ups, and it, it, like I said, it showed me that EG it maybe isn't as good as we were. As you know, we we all say they're number one, and they're still probably the number one seed. And I'd say that yeah, obviously they're still one, but you know maybe the skill gap's a little bit closer. Maybe they're not as dominant as we we previously thought. Maybe I, I actually go the other way, and I think that this showed that they're more dominant. That even in a tournament where they don't play well, that they didn't put in as much practice, and they aren't slaying very well. Um, they're still so well disciplined and, and smart uh, that they and like function so well as a team that they can win those games despite not playing well. Yeah, I mean, so I, I guess you can look at you know look at a coin two ways. So yeah, exactly. yeah. So we go into game two is Shrine Slayer, and uh, they they showed this later on like in a clip of, on Sunday, I believe. Um, a couple different players having issues with their cords. So the controllers at the tournament, um, you know, Xbox One is all wireless controllers. So you have to have your uh, micro USB cord plugged into your controller with no batteries in your controller. And because of that, if your cord wiggles or comes loose at all, your controller is going to disconnect from the game and you're not going to be able to move. So this happens a few times actually to snipe down in the Shrine Slayer game. Yeah, but uh, Towie being the... uh, the coach that prepared and uh, excellent coach he is 
has one, a spare cord on him that he's able to uh, hand a snipe down and he can switch out and finish it. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, I guess he pulled pulled it out of his pocket, but yeah, he just uh, pulled know, it out of his let's, pocket. Let's, like, just, let's go with magic. Let's let's you know, <laughs> speaking to a coach here, you know, you're a former coach. Uh-huh. Do you guys carry spare parts on you? Is that something you guys are accustomed to? Can you just like do you got like um, a controller sitting around? You, you have a cord sitting my, around. You have an extra guess. headset sitting around. Well, so my guess, it's not so much that you're like, oh, I need to have this for my team, but it's more like he had it. Let me give it to him. So you have your own controller. You're going to bring a controller. So you have your own. You have your own headset with you and everything where if something happens, hey, I can just give him my controller. Yeah, it might not be his, but it's better than his if his breaks. But you, you know take I mean? that so, with you onto the stage? Like, it's just, it was, the best part was, I mean, like, Tawi was just, yeah. like, like, it wasn't a big deal. He just reached yeah. in his pocket, pulled out a cord, and handed it to him. Like, you know, this, ah, this happens all the time. Yeah, no, um, I mean, you have your, I had, a, at least I did, I had a little backpack. Um, just one of those drawstring ones that I kept controller in and stuff. So, you know, it's not difficult to just reach down, grab that, and hand it. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit easier because I think he literally just had it in his pocket. And it's just like, oh. Okay, here you go. Yeah. You know, may, I don't know. Maybe he actually was prepared and was like, I need to have extras. It's probably something smart to do is to have extras for, for your team and everything. Yeah, is this the next level of coaching? <laughs> I mean, Towie is the next level coach, so. <laughs> I, I'm just, I would like to imagine that his pockets are uh, like uh, Mary Poppins' bag. And I, I believe just, that's probably the case. He actually. can just pull out whatever he wants. Like if it was, you know, oh, your Xbox One froze, let me just pull out a new Xbox One for it. Yeah. Hashtag Towie's pockets. Yeah, seriously. Um, but yeah, so in, in this game, there wasn't a huge like we were talking about the the controller issue and everything, but the the game itself, um, it was fairly close, like back and back and back and forth, or or like within one, three four kills uh, at all all moments. But in t- until the end, um, EG pulls out a little bit separates themselves a little bit and wins 50 43 there wasn't any like major talking points i feel like from this game so yeah it was fairly straightforward i'm um eg was in the lead the whole time c9 tried keeping it close and they did for the most part but like you said right towards the end eg ends up extending out although i I don't know if it's this game uh or just in general but uh something that you don't see a lot from eg um or at least just the way the games pan out is lunchbox sniping but man oh, yeah, this that tournament was that was on. one thing lunchbox like throughout well i noticed it multiple times throughout the entire yeah, tournament lunchbox I, I, was sniping I think it was extremely a little later well. than this but yeah it was definitely multiple times and we'll talk about at the end of this who we think is mvp but i hands down thought he was the mvp of this tournament and we could discuss that later but yeah his i'm just gonna his sniping my like, mid-season predictions his, you don't expect <laughs> Lunchbox of all people with on a roster with both you know Snipe Down and Roy, who are some of the best players in the game, and Lethal, who's known for you know having a decent sniper himself. Yeah. You know you don't expect Lunchbox to really get the sniper and do much with it, but there was a good portion where I was watching where he was hitting a hundred percent headshots. Like he had six shots I counted in a row without missing a headshot, and I yeah. was just like, what the hell? Where where has he been practicing <laughs> his sniping? Has he been playing? Two I mean, and that, that's himself? the thing, like. He's actually, he's always, and this is why, one of the reasons why, like, I mentioned the other week, um, Lunchbox being an MVP c- candidate for me, uh, and, and like, the MVP of the, the league or whatever, is not just because of how much he does objectively, but it's because he does that and can do the other roles. Like, he could be the sniper on most teams, I feel like. He's just, he's a very skilled player, but because of what he has to do for his team, he doesn't get as many opportunities to showcase that. But I felt like in this tournament, he really did. He, he was sniping a lot. And there was one point where um, I think it was coming down towards the end, and uh, it was either Roy or Snipe Down. One of them actually gave up the sniper to, like, dropped it for uh, Lunchbox to get because he was shooting so well. Yeah, I, I think it was Snipe Down, actually, missed a couple shots and then was like, here, I'm just going to, he died. Picked it back up and then ran over to Lunchbox and dropped it for him towards yeah. the end of one of the Shrine Slayer games. We'll have to see what happens come finals, but... He's not going to be their sniper. I'm no, not... No, I'm, I'm just saying, but... like, that's the side of Lunchbox. We don't... We, at least I haven't don't seen get up to, see to this very point. Often. Yeah. And I was thoroughly impressed. Yeah. Yeah, it was some great play by him. So, going into um, Game 4, um, right? Or is it Game 3? This is Game... Game 3. Four, three, three. Game, game 3. Um... Or what, what game is it? It's game three. Game three, yeah, because it finished... Okay. Uh, game three was Lockdown King of the Hill. Um, 
And Cloud9 got an early bottom blue spawn trap uh, with Victory X, another person that you wouldn't normally associate as being the sniper on a team with, you know, Hysteria and uh, Fear Itself and Pistola and stuff. But uh, Victory X is sniping, and uh, they got almost all of the B hill um, on uh, that top uh, BR tower hill. Yeah, it was um, either 48 or 49 seconds out of the whole minute. Yeah, so they got, yeah, almost the entire thing and took a lead uh, 49 to 5. Um, after the first two hills, so there's 10 minutes left in the game. After the first rotation, so after the first six minutes, um, Cloud9 is up 79-66, and it was kind of just like, you know, getting a few seconds here or there, uh, except for D-Hill where um, EG got most of their time in that in. Okay, no problem. Uh, sorry, wife was talking to me real fast. <laughs> um, and then in the second rotation, um, Cloud9 uh, maintains their lead, you know, roughly the same uh, 147 to 121. So a 26-second lead there. Um, um, going into the last hill, um, so with one minute left, uh, the hill's rotating to um, top BR. Um, Cloud9's up seven seconds. Um, and EG just stayed cool got got some time in the the top or the a hill the top mid um got the the 19 seconds to get to 140 and then took 43 seconds of the final hill uh to win that game 183 to 147 um and it just again shows how cool uh and uh, like you know this the british saying cool as a cucumber eg is like they just like they don't get flustered they don't get rattled and they they keep like the, they're always in every game i feel like because of that yeah and this is another one where when you looked at the the stat line afterwards they were completely outslayed and i would say for the most part it might have even been another one where c9 had control of the map and just didn't get as much time as they needed and, you know, EG was able to take an adv- right at the end there. They were able to do what they needed to win. And it's just, we talk about it more and more, and it's just like, no matter how much you outslay them, they, they, you know, they're able to take advantage of their opportunities better than any other yeah, team. And especially in the King of the Hill game. Kills. They're very good at getting the kills yeah. that matter. You, even like you said, the 19 seconds in the A hill, that is unheard of. Um, yeah. Getting that much time in the A hill, they, they're they've shown that you know, what they're you know they can capitalize on these opportunities. C nine slipped just a little bit, and they were able to get nineteen seconds in the A hill, and you know uh, you're not that's not something you're gonna normal see. So you know, like as, back to our conversation earlier, either they're just that good, or maybe they're not as good as we thought because you know they're they're winning these games, but not by necessarily a lot. Um, but it was a super close series overall. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the games were close, but it ended up being uh, a clean 3-0 sweep uh, to EG. So then our other semifinal, um, winner's bracket semifinal, uh, is Denial versus Optic. And, uh, you know, Optic, after upsetting Winter Fox, um, you know, we've seen them there in some of the online cups, but I don't know if we necessarily expected to, to see them in this semifinal. Did you? Um... I would say before this tournament, before the tournament had started, I wasn't expecting Optic to be at this point. Once I saw, once the tournament started and I saw how well they were playing, I'm not surprised that they got to this point. Yeah. That, that's yeah, fair. Especially, I, yeah. yeah. So the first game was the Warlord flag again, and uh, Optic scored the first flag. They got you now four down twice in a row, and Assault um, <laughs> beat, got a flag beat down. And they, so they score, and that's all in the first minute. So they got two four downs in the first minute. So Optic has firm control of the map right now. Um, but uh, after getting that cap, you know, they, they lose uh, map control. You know, three players, it's very hard for them to maintain that. So Denial answers back uh, in the next minute and a half. Uh, so it's seven, uh, 17.30. Oh, sorry, not minute and a half. Like 10 minutes later, um, Denial gets their first cap, and that's with uh, two minutes and 30 seconds left in the game. Uh, they tie it 1-1, uh, and that's after Optic went for a flag toss up to base, and uh, I believe his ace um, was trying to toss that up, and he grabbed uh, the plasma rifle on accident um, when trying to grab twice. it. I believe There were two guns Yeah, there. well, he, he like, grabbed a, uh, the shotgun and then grabbed a, an assault rifle. 
Yeah, something like that. Or not the assault rifle, the plasma rifle. Assuming he had grabbed that flag and been able to toss it, they would have taken a 2-0 lead um, and then been uh, at least up 2-1 at this point rather than a Yeah, there's at least a very good chance that they would have capped that because I believe there was someone up there. Yeah, there was someone waiting it. for it too. Yeah, it was yeah. just super unfortunate that he couldn't get the toss. Yeah, it almost makes you wish that the game gave priority to objectives when you're trying to grab. But then you get the bad situation where you didn't you wanted to grab the the rockets on the ground instead of the flag or I mean, whatever. Yeah, yeah, there's no real answer on what should have priority, and it's I, I know people have been complaining about it since the game came out that flag objectives should have priority over weapons, and I would agree with that regardless of the weapon. I think um, the objectives yeah. should have priority, and it's just it's something that kind of players have been asking for, but we haven't seen any you know response from three four three about it. Yeah, especially over a plasma rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so then, um, well, I think your notes were a little wrong. So that wasn't with two minutes left in the game. That was just shortly after um, Optic scored the first win. Uh, they were running the second, and then Denial stopped it, and then got a counter cap to make it 1-1. And then, so with 22 minutes left, um, or seven minutes in, in regulation, Denial is now starting to get map control. And they uh, are able to uh, score another one, uh, just a very methodical one. Um, and then uh, Flamesword gets a camo, and Optic answers back. So it's just like a very back-and-forth type game. Denial uh, then, with uh, four minutes left in the game, scores a third. And then with two minutes left, um, Denial scores a fourth. And then uh, Optic going desperation, you know, right towards the end of the game. They do score a third one. Uh, with 40 seconds left, but then uh, Denial just turtles, basically, um, and just defends and just kills and stops Optic from uh, getting that for trying to pull that fourth flag and uh, tie it up. So, um, Denial does take game one, four to three. Yeah, it's not often that you see a team turtle up and it works, especially on Warlord, where you can kind of just nade it out. Well, for whatever reason, it did. You know, they didn't really leave their base and try to push out to a side base. They all just kind of hung out at their base and we're able to prevent optic. Um, yeah, I mean, when you only have when you're talking about just like 40 seconds or less, it it's something you know if they try to do that for a couple of minutes, there's zero chance of that working. But uh, with just a little bit left, you know, it only takes them getting one or two kills uh, to make it so it's not possible for uh, optics to score that flag. But then being all that close, it only takes a couple good grenades for optics. It's true. So yeah, it was surprising to say the least that 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 was the strategy they went with. Um, it ended up working in their favor, but it, it could have easily gone against them. I, I think maybe it might have shocked Optic a little bit, because I think Optic was even looking to the side bases and didn't see anything, and that allowed Opt or Denial to get first shots on them, and that's all it took to get them down and then hold on. Mm -hmm. So, game two is uh, Shrine Slayer, um, and uh, Denial really controlled the game for most of the most part, although it was, the score was close. Denial had like weapon control. They had... There was a moment where um, I believe it was in this match where um, they had both snipers and then one, or I think it was uh, Mikwin or a, no, APG died with one or something like that. And then Mikwin goes over and he drops his sniper, picks up the opponent's sniper, and then gets his sniper. And what it did was it, it sent his team sniper into uh, on respawn. And then the other team sniper was in his hand, technically. And, and he combined them. But his team's is the one that was on respawn, and so it allowed them to have control of snipers for almost the entire game. And then right towards the end, Denial finally, or Optic finally gets one, and uh, they are able to utilize it very effectively. They end up pulling away in the last, like, you know, it was like mid 30s, and it's like tied. And then by it, Optic ends up winning 50 to 40. Uh, Maniac had a couple of nice kills with the sniper and ended up finishing the game with a, a double kill uh, with the sniper on, with there a couple some, of headshots. I, if you didn't see that clip, for anyone that might be listening, I would, I'm would. i not sure at what point this is during the rebroadcast, but it was a super nice double kill um, to get to, to win the game. Like it, it, You were watching, you saw him hit both the headshots, and everyone was just like, damn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. So then and now the series is 1-1, and uh, Lockdown King of the Hill. Um... The second by the said second rotation, the first rotation there wasn't anything very notable. By the second rotation, Optic is now leading uh, 103 to 74, uh, so they got about a 30 second uh, lead, uh, 29. But um, and then uh, 
opt in the second rotation optic is able to hold out um, and basically no one got time for the entire second rotation um or the, for the third rotation like the the a and the b hill um and uh it finished 112 to 83 so in the last two minutes of the game um 18 seconds total were were collected of hill hill time yeah between both uh, teams. for both teams yeah. yeah between both teams so optic actually takes that and now they're up 2-1 in the series and it looks like they could be going to the the winner's final to place eg if they can pull out one more win against uh denial hashtag green wall yeah green wall i don't even know where on a, can you tell me i don't know where green i wall have comes no from. i just because they're green i i don't I know guess, where the like, wall comes from but i'm sure it's something I, to do with I like call of duty yeah or i assume something. it's a call of duty thing but yeah i have no idea yeah, so then uh, game four, uh, which we didn't see in the uh, the EG uh, Cloud9 series, is Shrine Bomb. And uh, so now it gets a really big spawn trap and uh, gets a plant, and they go up 1-0 after just three minutes of gameplay. Um, and then uh, Heinz gets some, uh, has some nice play just individually and uh, allows Denial to get a cap uh, again as they go 2-0 um, with just six minutes left in the game. Uh, with one minute left, you know, quote unquote optic decides to start playing, and uh, you know they basically they they push out and they cross the fifty yard line and get some control of the map for the first time, um, rather than just like struggling to to defend. And uh, they are able to cap one and make it one two, but uh, it's just a little too late, uh, too little too late, and so uh, they weren't able to score again. And denial wins two to one, and ties the series two to two. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, not to go off on a complete tangent, but I feel like in this tournament, more than I've seen in any other tournament, teams made a lot of late pushes to try to tie games up. Um, nor- yeah. I, I don't remember ever seeing like games where like in the last minute, the team that was down scored, regardless of what the score, you know, whether they're down one, down two, they were able to at least score. And you know, it's not something that I've seen in the past, and I'm not sure what you know if it's just coincidence that it happened so much, or if there's a reason behind it, but it just seemed to be happening in almost every game, the team that was down um always made a push at the end to try to come back yeah i really did and definitely online i don't think we ever saw it um i can't remember like i not specific times or anything but i do believe that in uh different land tournaments across the years i remember seeing quite a few late pushes uh, where it's almost like oh, our backs up against the wall we got to clutch it and a lot of players and a lot of teams are very good at that um so i don't know if it's just like uh you know in the moment, these players are just like, I have to go big, and they do type of deal, um, or what? But, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. We noticed quite a few of them at this tournament. Uh, definitely way more than we've seen online. Um, and then, so, Game 5, you know, this is what everyone wants to see is a Game 5, which is uh, Warlord Slayer. So, it's going to be fast, and uh, it's going to be crazy. So, after the first two opening two minutes, uh, very close game, Optics up three kills 23 to 20 um and then uh it, it kind of like optic had a 25 23 lead so still very two kill lead uh then uh just one minute later denial has a one kill lead and then one minute after that denial has a five kill lead so it's now 41 36 and then one more minute after that denial's up uh, 49 42 so basically it was close until the 30 se- second or 20 28 27 uh, score and then Denial just every minute just increase the lead just one or two more until they find it, finally ended up winning uh, 50 to 44. Yeah, Optic was the first team to hit the halfway point at the 25 kill mark and had a two yeah. kill lead at that point. But then, yeah, right after that mark, Denial tied it up and then just slowly but surely fought, you know, pushed ahead until they ended up winning, showing that, you know, they're the superior team and were able to do what they need to do to control the map and get the game five win. Yeah, so I mean that was our that was pretty much Saturday night. Um, I do believe, I believe lose bracket round six where CLG beat Noble uh, started on Sunday. Yeah. So our and Saturday I mean, concluded I, with. Yeah, our Saturday concluded with that, and like that was the greatest way to go out on a Saturday night. I think. Yeah, huge there was, game five. Like there were over ten thousand people wire. in chat watching. Like it was, it was super hype. That was the most people viewing all day. Um, game five, a super close series. Optic kind of surprising people. 
um, making a, a very close series against the Nile, um, showing that they must have been putting in practice that we weren't seeing. And just all yeah, around, no. it was great for not only both teams, even though Optic lost, but it was also great for uh, HCS all around. To have the yeah, last potentially two of the biggest FPS organizations there is, you know, with hashtag Greenwall, hashtag Wolfpack. I feel like Denial and uh, Optic are probably the two biggest or most well-known FPS organizations. So yeah, for sure. um, definitely very hyped in the, that last series and last game of the night. Um, so that is our, that puts uh, Denial and EG, which, you know, common theme into our winner's bracket finals. Yeah. Um, Want and, me to uh, take back over here? For a little bit yeah then... well i i think you know we that was the end of the saturday night and they took a break so maybe with like a five minute break that works for me all right um so thanks guys for listening to this first uh half of the um podcast uh we're gonna have the the next one out shortly um if you're watching live uh or on youtube um that will be uh all together but uh, if you're listening through itunes uh expect the next one very very soon and uh, you can catch us on Twitter, uh, or me, at, at Fady Fade. And then uh, Phelan is uh, at Phelan, I believe, with yep, a three. Yeah, F-A-I-L-3-N. And you can and also catch right, me so, on Twitch TV, slash Phelan. Yeah, th- thanks for listening to this first uh, part one, and part two coming at you shortly.